Hello, everyone. Good evening and welcome to our first talk in a series of conversations about mental health and staying mindful while at home. I'm Joanna Nikas, an editor for Styles at the New York Times, and I'm thrilled to be joined today by the singer, songwriter, and producer, Jewel. Jewel, welcome and thank you for being here. Hi, thanks for having me. So how are you? Where are you now? I'm good. I'm at my house in Colorado. Nice. Surrounded by beautiful candles and... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's nice to be in nature during this time. Yes. Um, so I'm just going to give us a quick run of show. First, we're going to meditate with Jewel for about five minutes. Then we're going to chat for about 20 minutes. And afterwards, there will be time for a couple questions from the audience. And then we'll close out and Jewel will perform her new single, Grateful. So if you have a question you want to ask Jewel, please use the raised hand feature in Zoom. If you're chosen to ask your question, you'll hear from one of the producers in the chat. And please note that this event is being recorded. So let's start with the guided meditation. We'll follow your lead here, tell us where to sit, and we'll give everybody a moment to settle in. So for somebody who's never meditated before, what advice would you give them? Uh, first, I would just say get comfortable. Sit somewhere where you feel like you can lean up against something if that's possible. No big deal if you can't. Uh, while you're settling in and getting comfortable, um, I sort of feel like there's two forms of mindfulness. There's meditation. I liken that to doing a bicep curl in the gym. Um, they've actually proven that in eight weeks you can grow gray matter. You can shrink your amygdala. Uh, so it really is like a workout for your brain and it helps you be consciously present. That's pretty much what it does. And then putting mindfulness into motion is learning to take that muscle and use it throughout your day to create change and create habit changes. Um, so when we're thinking about being mindful, it's just a fancy word of, you know, just a different way of saying you're being consciously present. Mm -hmm. So a lot of my type A friends feel like they can't really meditate because they get lost in thoughts. They have all these thoughts. Right. That's okay. You have a brain and you're going to have thoughts while you meditate. Um, so that isn't losing. And in fact, every time you notice your thinking and you come back to your breath, that's the bicep curl. That's winning. Mm -hmm. So the more times you get lost in thought and come back to the breath, that's winning. That's actually building new neural patterns and helping you build new folds in your frontal lobes. So the practice I want to do with you today was given to me by a friend. And I've actually never led it before, but I thought today would be a good time to start. The concept of a field in a tree can be found in every ancient culture on every continent. It's a really potent and really powerful image. So what I'm going to do is do a guided meditation where you walk into a field of your own choosing and you sit under the shade of a really big tree. You can look however you want. So we're going to start there. Start by closing your eyes and we're going to take five deep breaths in our nose and out of our mouth. We really want to think about unlocking our jaw. We carry so much tension in our jaw. So we're going to take five deep breaths in our nose and out our mouth. As you do it, notice the sensations in your body. One more in your nose. Ah, and out your mouth. I'm always amazed at how in five breaths my body can feel entirely different. So I want you to keep your breathing calm and regular, long, deep breaths in your nose and out your mouth. And as you do this, I want you to begin imagining you're walking out into a field. Imagine what the field looks like, whether it's a moon or whether it's daylight, whether the grass is tall or short. Notice the smells in the air. And in the not so far distance, you see a tree. It's a big tree, it's impressive. You start walking out towards the tree. And with each step, you notice you're getting more relaxed. With each step, you notice your entire body is filled with the beauty of the nature that's around you. You start to feel like you're stripping yourself of all the weights in the day, all of the thoughts, all of the tasks. And you finally arrive to this tree and you decide to sit down at the base of the tree. 
And with a deep breath and a deep exhale, you sit. I want you to feel your back into that tree. Whatever it is you're leaning against at the house, really feel like you can settle into it. Imagine you're being supported by this huge tree behind you. And now I want to imagine with every breath that all the roles you play, all the roles you take on are falling away. You're nobody's sister. You're nobody's brother. You're nobody's boss. You're nobody's employee. You're nobody's mother. You're nobody's father. All the roles that we take on, all the energy that we spend during the day, all of the hats that we wear. Feel what it's like to have, be free of all of those different roles and to just be supported for being nothing other than what you are. You don't need to do anything for love. You don't need to perform. You don't need to do anything other than just be. And as you sit, we're gonna take five more breaths and feel that sensation of being supported, truly supported. This is a neutral space. You don't have to expend energy. You don't have to be anybody, just yourself. Feel what it's like to be in your own energy, in your own body, completely neutral. And we'll take five breaths in your nose and out your mouth. And with each breath, you feel the sensation of this relaxation going deeper and deeper. We're gonna take one more breath and really feel that in your back, that support. Feel the grass under your seat. Feel how all your nerves are able to calm and still as you're able to just be with one more big breath in your nose and out your mouth. This field exists all the time. This tree is always here waiting for you. This neutral space where you don't have to expend any energy, where you don't have to play any role, where you can just be and know that you're supported. Notice what your body feels like when it's like this, the calmness, the open, calm, grounded feeling. Notice if that seems different than how you feel the rest of your day. And maybe make a commitment to come back here once a day, a couple times if you need it, because it's always waiting. And with one final breath, we'll begin to stand and walk back out of our field. And when you're ready, you can open your eyes. Wow, thank you so much. You're welcome. I wish all our live events started that way. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always amazed at how much my voice changes. Like I can hear the difference in your voice too. It's amazing. Um, yeah, actually, that was one of my questions. Do you think medit meditation has changed your voice? I don't know if it's changed my singing voice. Mm -hmm. Mindfulness has made me better at everything I've ever done. Mindfulness is like cheating. Um, there's a saying in some of the traditions I was raised in that perception is power. So if you want to become more powerful, you have to perceive more. The only way to perceive more is to be more present. Mindfulness is the practice of training that muscle to become present. So whether it's a business meeting or whether I'm singing on stage, the more present you are, the more you notice, the more you're seeing. And it's amazing. It really does start to feel like cheating because you start to get a real advantage over people that aren't present. Uh, so it's made me better at my craft for sure. Mm -hmm. um, the more present and the more curious, the more observant you are, the better you're going to become, the more you're able to excel. So let's just back up a little bit. Um, you were raised in Alaska with your father and brothers and at the age of 15, you decided to leave home to go to San Diego. Can you talk to us a bit about what you learned in that early period of your life? 
Yeah, my mom left when I was eight. My dad took over raising us. He was a Vietnam vet and had also had a really abusive background. And when my mom left, he started trauma triggering. We didn't know that word, of course. He was drinking to try and medicate that and it worked out fairly predictably. And we had a really difficult relationship. Um, he was abusive and I ended up leaving when I was 15, started paying rent. And I knew that kids like me end up typically being a statistic. Typically we repeat the cycle that we're raised by. And I didn't wanna be a statistic. And I realized I was taught an emotional language in my house. It, I called it emotional English and it was invisible. It was something I learned over you know, a million interactions. And if I didn't like my emotional language, if I didn't think my nurture was good, could I ever get to know my real nature? How do you get to know your real nature if your nurture isn't good? Are you destined to repeat this cycle? Those were the things I was really wanting to tackle really consciously when I moved out at 15 and a bit naively, I called it my happiness journal. And I began writing and taking notes and doing little, I called them experiments, um, watching people, seeing how they behaved, seeing if I could adopt those behaviors. And I did pretty well. I got myself through school. I ended up graduating from a prestigious fine arts high school when I was uh, 17 or 18. And then I moved to San Diego to take care of my mom who was sick. And I was working in a computer warehouse and a boss propositioned me. And when I wouldn't sleep with him, he wouldn't give me my paycheck and I couldn't pay my rent. And I thought it wasn't too big a deal. I thought I'd live in my car for a couple months, get a new apartment, get back on my feet but it didn't work out like that. I was having panic attacks. Um, I had bad kidneys. I almost died in the emergency room parking lot because they wouldn't see me because I didn't have insurance. Mm -hmm. I was sitting in the passenger seat. I had sepsis, uh, blood poisoning, and I was throwing up all over myself. And luckily a doctor had seen me get turned away and he tapped on my window and he gave me antibiotics that saved my life that night. Wow. Uh, and then the car I was living in got stolen, which sucked, but I wasn't in it. So that was way less sucky. I was stealing a lot. Um, I was becoming agoraphobic. I felt like if I left the street corner or the car that I was living in, I thought I would be stricken with illness. Uh, one day I was trying to steal a dress in a store and I saw my reflection in the mirror and I saw what I looked like and I was a statistic. And it hit me really hard. I, I hadn't beaten the odds. Three short years later, my whole life had come to a grinding halt with anxiety and panic. And for some reason, I remember this quote by Buddha that said, happiness doesn't depend on who you are or what you have. It depends on what you think. And I had this strange privilege of being stripped of everything but my thoughts. And I wanted to see if I could turn my life around one thought at a time. But when you have that much anxiety, you can't perceive your thoughts in real time. I had no idea what I was thinking. So I thought I could hack my way into my brain by watching my hands. Um, if you want to see what you're thinking, watch what your hands are doing because it's your thought cooled down into action. And so I left the store. I didn't steal the dress and I decided that I would journal about everything my hands did for two weeks. That was my giant life plan at that point. Um, I did it and I just watched every time they opened a door or wouldn't shake a hand. I continued stealing. It wasn't something I was able to quit overnight, but I noticed it and I wrote it down. And at the end of the weeks, I looked over it and realized I quit believing in myself. But more than that, my anxiety virtually disappeared. It was a completely shocking side effect to me um, and very noticeable because when you suffer from that much anxiety, the relief is overwhelming. It's so noticeable. And that was the beginning of my mindfulness journey. I think writing is a mindfulness practice. So I'd been writing from such a young age. I think that's one of the reasons I had a natural ability to be observant and curious. And then I just started developing more and more exercises um, and having more and more realizations and building more and more um, ways to become more present. I didn't know that word at the time, but that's basically what I was doing. Right. And I'm curious, um, you know, how you developed these coping skills before you even had the language. You had said a couple of times, I didn't know what was happening. I had a happiness journal. I started writing things down. How did you know something was wrong? When you feel bad, you notice it. Mm -hmm. um, it's so, I hated it. I hated feeling bad. It was excruciating to me. And I'm, I'm a really sensitive person. So, I mean, everybody is, but it was excruciating. I didn't want to spend the rest of my life that way. It felt like a death sentence. And for whatever reason, I never wanted to kill myself. I was just determined. I have to try something different today than I did yesterday mm -hmm. and see how I feel. And I just kept experimenting and I kept staying in my body. I mean, don't get me wrong. I disassociated like most people with a lot of trauma 
But for the most part, I was able to use my body as a barometer and I began to notice patterns. Um, I began to notice that there were only two states where I felt open and calm or where I, felt, where I felt really tight. And I noticed every thought, feeling, or action led to one of those two states. So I just began to become very religious about journaling. I'm really anxious. My body feels really uptight. What was I just thinking or what was I just doing? And I started to track it. And when you start to see it in black and white in a journal, you do start to see patterns. And I could see all the thoughts and feelings that made me feel dilated and all the feelings that made me feel contracted. Mm -hmm. And I learned I could hack my way out of anxious states by forcing myself to participate in an emotion, a feeling, or an action that dilated me. Now I've learned that there's a lot of science behind that. When you participate in something like gratitude, for instance, um, the trick is it can't just be mental. Your whole body has to feel stimulated by something. Um, and when it does, you have a biochemical reaction. Your body's listening to your brain. And you have neurotransmitters that change. Your vascular system dilates. Your blood pressure drops. And the blood flow actually even changes in your brain. Uh, and so it's amazing. And it's instant. And it's all within our ability. The thing that really I was counting on at the time is I had no resources. I had no family. I had no safety net. I was alone. I was also very skeptical and afraid of strangers or anybody. So I was very isolating and I needed to find things that made me feel better. I didn't have therapists. I didn't have access to anything else and I didn't want to kill myself, but I also didn't want to live like I was. And so it was very motivating, I guess. <laughs> And you recently produced a film with Deepak Chopra called The Mindfulness Movement that explores how meditation is used to work through this trauma. What was the most surprising thing that you learned from that film? The word mindfulness or meditation, you know, it's been around a long time, obviously. In the States, it was sort of relegated. There was a new age movement in the 90s. It was something I never talked about because I didn't like the way people perceived the word uh, meditation or even the word optimism. To me, optimism is a gritty thing. Um, when you see what's wrong in the world, when you don't kid yourself, when the veil has been ripped from your eyes and you grew up bar singing and you grew up being treated really horribly and you see all the hurt and the wrong in the world, but the people that still choose to see that and say, but I'm going to make a difference tomorrow, that's a very gritty thing. Um, but in the 90s, the word meant denial. You know, it meant you were maybe sticking your head in the sand. Everything was rainbows and unicorns. And I didn't like that. Um, it didn't make me feel represented for how I engaged in that act. So now, flash forward to now, and you can use words like mindfulness, and it's a pop culture word. It's on the cover of Time magazine. It's not relegated to hippies and... Uh, and the like, that's a nice thing. Um, I think also starting to see that science is caught up. You know, we've able, been able to brain map and see that you can grow brain matter through neuroplasticity. You can shrink your amygdala where your anxiety lives. Um, you can see neurochemical transmitters changing. That's impressive. And I think it helps people have the resolve to begin practicing a new skill of mindfulness. And there's this really powerful moment in the film um, for those of you who haven't seen it yet, um, where one of the students who's part of your Jewel Never Broken Foundation talks about her own struggles with suicidal ideation and self-harm. Um, it was just a very powerful moment. What is the work that you do with those, with those youth to help them deal with their trauma? As I said, I think there's two forms of mindfulness. There's meditation and mindfulness in motion. For whatever reason, one of my talents was figuring out how to make exercises that I could practice every day that would create change. I really wanted results. And I wanted results I could use with little access to other resources. And I formed a youth foundation 18 years ago where we work with kids with suicidal ideation, severe anxiety, severe trauma. And they don't have access. These are not wealthy kids and we don't have the ability or the funding to have you know, psychotherapists on staff. So I developed this curriculum and we started instituting it into our foundation where the kids practice, we teach them entrepreneurial skills. Um, we teach them mindfulness, lots of things, everything from you become what you hate. So if you don't want to become whatever it is you hate, let's say it's your parents, you have to forgive them. You have to find a way to have uh, forgiveness and compassion because otherwise you harden and you become what you focus on. Um, 
that nobody's coming for you. You're coming for you. When I realized that, it changed my life. I stopped being a victim and angry, and I started going, all right, nobody owes me anything. I owe myself a lot, and I'm capable. And starting to teach these kids how capable they are and seeing the turnaround that they're all it's amazing. I've, I have not seen it fail. We lose some kids where they'll drop out once in a while and then they end up coming back in. Um, but without, a sh I mean, it's amazing the transformations. Cheryl might be the girl you're talking about. She had tried to kill herself twice and um, learned to sit with every thought. And once you start to realize not every thought and feeling is a fact, we kind of think everything our brain comes up with is gospel and it isn't. Mm -hmm. Our brains are these binary computers that move toward pleasure and move away from pain. And we lay down memories to help us to remember where those things are. And we start to think that everything it's been programmed with is truth. And it isn't, it's very relative to how we're feeling. It's relative to our upbringing and our programming. Um, I remember reading Descartes, I think therefore I am. And if I could rephrase that a little bit, I'd say it's, I perceive what I think therefore I am. And once we start teaching people and these kids specifically that they're not their thoughts, they're the observer. Um, so if your car, your body was a car, your brain is not the driver, it's the steering wheel. It can go on autopilot and most of us are on autopilot and we're frustrated because we end up repeating the cycle or we yell at our kids like our parents did and we swore we never would. But your brain really is the steering wheel, it's an amazing tool. We're the observer of that. That's the driver. Um, so whatever religious denomination you do or don't come from, we can all relate to the fact that we can observe our thoughts. We can observe that we're sad. And if we can observe we're sad, we're something other than it. We're the observer of it. And so for me, mindfulness is powerful. And we start to be able to perceive a thought, negative self-talk. We create a gap before we act on it. Mm -hmm. And in that gap is where change happens. Um, one of the reasons we get so anxious is because we're not present. We're not awake in this gap and we know it. It's like leaving a kid unattended in a house. They're going to get really anxious because the parent isn't present. It, it can be like that with anxiety as well. So with the kids, we teach them these skills and let's see last year, 99% of our kids earned their own college scholarship. We don't give them scholarship money and 90% of them were Ivy league. And these were not high performing students. These kids were all dropouts, you know, and, fifth, sixth, seventh grade. So I'm really proud of them. That's amazing. And what advice do you give them usually, you said you, to create that gap between like feeling something and being reactive about it, then to kind of taking a pause and responding in a way that, um, you know, isn't out of um, just a reaction. What, what is it that you kind of like talk them through? Um, having really specific exercises. So one is called writing down all the lies. Um, mm -hmm. I think on my website, I call it self and other, where you write a piece of paper, draw a line down the middle, and then you write down everything your brain's telling you. Um, do it when you're acutely triggered, you know, when you're really anxious, when you really notice your body's tight. That's a really good clue that your head's messing with you. Mm -hmm. So make a commitment to sit down and then just write out every single thing your brain is telling you. Um, for Cheryl, when she first did this, she was in the psych ward after um, the attempts on her life. And we went in and I'll never forget the first time she did. I mean, I still have that piece of paper. Um, her dad was alcoholic and had often tried suicide attempts and had told her that it was her fault and those things. And she believed it. And so she started writing down all these things. Um, all the lies that her head tell her. And then on the other side, she would start to tell herself the truth. And it is amazing. We do know the truth. There is a part of us that does know once we start observing that that isn't the truth. And even if you can't quite find it right away, the willingness to believe that might not be the truth, those lies, all the negative self-talk, that's a huge step toward just becoming present and being able to go, I'm willing to accept not every one of those as a fact. Mm -hmm. And if you keep investigating, if you keep being curious, you'll start to realize that isn't me. One of the things I love about anxiety is when I stopped looking at anxiety as an enemy that I wanted to push away, I wanted to disassociate from anxiety. Every time it came up, it frightened me. I wanted to push it away. It almost entangles you more into the behavior. When I learned that anxiety was an ally, it was trying to tell me something I was doing was not agreeing with my nature. It's like food poisoning. You know, if you eat something that makes you sick, throwing up lets you know it doesn't agree with you. Our anxiety can be seen and leveraged as an ally. If you'll stop and get curious, what was I just thinking? What was I just doing? Or who was I just around? 
Because if I'm this anxious, I'm willing to accept that those aren't authentic to my nature. They don't agree with me. And if you start abstaining from those thoughts, if you start abstaining from those feelings or abstaining from those activities, your anxiety should lessen. Mm -hmm. And for those of you just joining us now, um, Jewel and I are chatting for about five more minutes, then we will take questions from the audience. So if you have questions, please um, just raise your hand in Zoom. Um, and then we're gonna listen to Jewel's latest single called Grateful. Um, so I had a question. You, your first album, Piece of You, sold millions of copies, and then at some point in your career, you found yourself in debt, and you've been pretty open about talking about that. Do you think meditation has shifted your relationship with money in any way? It was really, it shifted my relationship, obviously, with myself and with my mom. Um, I wrote a book called Never Broken, and it really does take 300 and something pages for me to describe that relationship and what really happened. Um, I'd say the bottom line was there was a part of me that wanted love more than it wanted the truth. Mm. And the truth always wins. And it cost me a lot, mm -hmm. not just financially, but emotionally, mostly. Working out of that and really seeing the truth of what that was, was a really long journey. Again, if I didn't have mindfulness, the ability to perceive myself, perceive my actions, perceive what was authentic and what wasn't, I would have been lost. I don't think I ever would have made it out of that time. Mm -hmm. And what, is your mindful, what does your meditative and mindfulness practice look like today? I'm actually writing a book about change and the nature of change, um, how we can rewire really deep-seated habits. Um, and so I really go into my practice in this book. Um, but basically it's sitting and doing my practice. Uh, I sit down, I meditate, I do something called a hoop practice, which is an extension of the field um, that I shared with you. Um, and as I grow and evolve, my practice grows and evolves depending on what I'm doing and what I'm working on. The important thing is that we practice. Um, it isn't called a right, you know, arriving, it's called practicing. Uh, we practice mindfulness, we practice uh, new ways of being. We practice exercises because we want to become different. We want results. If all you do is meditate, but you don't have some type of daily practice or exercise you can instill during the day, you're not going to change. You're going to go from feeling good when you're alone in a dark room meditating. And the second you open the door and life hits you, you're going to be triggered into all of your old patterns. So um, for me, a lot of the exercises I do are up on jewelneverbroken.com. Mm -hmm. um, they've been proven to rewire your brain. They're simple three minute exercises. Uh, Dr. Judson Brewer, a uh, neuroscientist shows why they work. Um, and so a lot of those practices, the things I use to really overcome all kinds of things from panic attacks to shoplifting, do you name it, um, are up on that website. Great. Thank you. And yeah, we can paste that website in the chat for those of you who want to, to go check it out and see the tips. Um, and like you said, a lot of times you'll hear people say that meditation is hard because your mind wanders off or because they can't be consistent. Do you ever meditate badly or does it ever not work? <laughs> yeah, I think everybody feels like you, when you meditate, it should be like rainbows and unicorns and you have the universal ohm with the universe. It isn't like that every time. Um, it isn't like that a lot of the times. What should happen is your vascular system should dilate you should feel calmer. But I've had times where I'm really anxious. I can't get calmer while I meditate. You just still do the practice. Uh, meditation's super easy. There's a form I teach on my website. You basically pick a number, pick three. Uh, and if you have time for three breaths, that's great. You take three breaths and it's just breathing in is one, breathing out is two, breathing in is three, and breathing out is four. When you notice you're lost in thought, Get excited because when you notice it and you come back, you just built muscle. So don't look at it like losing. I really look at it like winning. Like you get excited. You're like, woo, I just noticed I was lost in thought. Get lost in thought 50 times. It really doesn't matter. There's no, uh, <laughs> it isn't a metric the way we think. We have to realize that we don't practice these things to become more perfect. We practice them to become more in harmony with ourselves and with our surroundings and to have a better experience. And it does take practice. It's like going to the gym. It's not always fun. And then once you get addicted to going to the gym, it starts to be like, why don't I do this every day? It's amazing. Um, and I'm just going to ask one more question. And we're going to take a couple questions from the audience. And then here you perform your latest single, Grateful. 
Um, interviewing you was on my grateful list today, gratitude list today, which I write every day and share with a group of women um, as part of my practice. So I just wanted to hear you do like a live gratitude list. What are you grateful for today? Oh my gosh, I'm grateful for my health. I'm oddly, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, I'm fascinated by this period that we're in. The experience is on us, whether we like it or not. We're not in control of COVID. Nature is. And so I've learned to be grateful for the time I have home, the time I have with my son. I'm grateful for my mindfulness practice that I can ask myself, what do I want to get out of this experience? Because this experience is happening. What do I want to get out of it? Are there things I've always wanted to leave behind? Um, are there new habits I've wanted to learn that I never thought I had time to? I really see this pandemic as threefold. It's the virus, it's the economic fallout, and there's gonna be a mindfulness, uh, mental health fallout. Mm -hmm. Suicides typically nearly double during a recession. Last year, there were 1.4 million suicide attempts. You double that number, you're looking at the potential loss of life from mental health issues being greater than the virus. We need to spread awareness about this. When you look at Me Too, bullying, gun violence, pollution, et cetera, they all, to me, the only elegant solution is mental health, mental hygiene. We have hygiene for our teeth and for our health, but we don't really think about what is a good mental hygiene practice? Why do we let every junky thought get indulged? How do we learn to curate our thoughts? How do we learn to work with our emotions and make them work for us instead of being subject to them? These are really important things to think about. It was important before COVID. I do feel like COVID has shed a light on these issues and for that I'm grateful. So now we'll go to some audience questions. Um, Michael, you are up first. I do a TV show on Zoom and it always takes a while for people to come in from the waiting room. Hi, can y'all hear me? Yeah, hi. Hi, um, I started having bad panic attacks at the uh, in January and I, I ended up in a uh, CSU and uh, crisis stabilization unit and I was on some meds and I'm currently trying to come off out of van. I'm only on 2.5 now, but I find it really difficult. And I wonder if you address that any, I really want to get off the drugs. I was never on them before. I don't like how they make me feel. And so I wonder if you address that any. Thank you for sharing that. Um, having panic attacks is horrible. They feel horrible. If nobody's ever had them, you do feel like you're dying. Your body completely shuts down. It's very, very difficult. So I have a ton of compassion for you. Um, I am not a doctor, of course, so I wanna make sure I say that. I don't really, I'm not qualified to talk about medication or anything like that. I can talk from my own experience. I don't have panic attacks anymore. I developed an exercise. It's in my book, Never Broken. Um, Basically, the meditation that I developed that I learned I could get myself out of a panic attack involved me imagining certain colors, tastes, smells. I had a really strong, I was able to visualize these things. What I learned later about panic attacks is our brain goes offline. So if you watch an MRI, MRI, the blood flow literally leaves your frontal lobes where you have logic. That's why it's so illogical. Um, you're not responding to your surroundings, as you know. And it all goes into your amygdala and this fight or flight response happens. So what I intuitively stumbled on is when I make my brain deal with sight, touch, smell, color, it has to process that information and it has to bring blood flow back into my frontal lobes. Um, and so that meditation's in the book, if that does help you. I learned once I got myself kind of to the end of this meditation, I could ask myself questions. What am I so afraid of? If you can get very curious, you can start to notice your triggers. I noticed in my life that if there was one or more major pillars changing in my life, so if I was going to a brand new school and switching houses or you know, two foundational things changing, if I was getting a new job, even just one foundational thing was enough to trigger me. And so I learned that my self-care had to be immaculate. I had to really heighten it. 
um, if I knew I was going to move or I knew I had a midterm due or things like that that just were causing my system to shut down. I had to create a network of friends. I didn't always have a network of friends, um, but I was able to create self-care in other ways. Going in nature always really helped me going for a walk, just being aware of it. And so with curiosity, you're going to do as much for yourself. This is terrible to say, don't sue me. Um, as a therapist can, you're an expert in you. You're not, a, you're not powerless, you're not helpless. You know about you. You really need to relax enough to help yourself get very curious. What is triggering me? What am I afraid of? Ask yourself good questions and see if those techniques of while you're in a panic attack, even though you wanna throw up, make yourself smell a strawberry or tap your body so you feel a physical sensation on both sides of your body because it causes your brain to deal with that information. I hope that's helpful. I really do believe there's a ton of hope for you. Thank you. Brooke, you're up next. I see somebody asking about the stigma involved with mental health. It is amazing how there's stigma. I don't know why there's stigma because we all have a brain and it's complex. It's way more complex than our teeth. So I don't know why having mental hygiene is a big deal. I don't know a single person, color, race, or creed, or socioeconomic background that hasn't struggled with anxiety or fear or worry and had it hold us back. So why this isn't a subject in school, I'll never understand. Um, but the only way to get out of the stigma is to have no shame and talk about it. <laughs> Hi, can you hear me? Hi, Brooke. Hi, first I'll say, Jewel, I'm very grateful for you and your music all the time. I was eight years old with a baby Taylor guitar playing You Were Meant For Me. <laughs> so I'm grateful for this opportunity to say hi. And I had a quick question. Um, I have a pretty okay meditation practice and I'm working on it now during this time, especially having more time at home. But I'm curious, I'm trying to work on tapping more into my intuition and really like my decision making. Um, and getting more in touch with that part of myself. So I'm curious if you have any tips or tricks on how you kind of tap into that for yourself. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, gosh, I wish I had more time. I would share a practice with you. It's good to know where our intuition lives. All of us are going to experience feelings in different places in our body. Curiosity feels very mental to me. I love curiosity, but it does feel like all my energy is here. When I stop and I ask to become intuitive, when I ask to feel the experience of intuition, I feel like it's much more in my body and I feel my whole system soften in a very different way than curiosity. A really important thing is to not be in the idea of something, but be in the experience of something. So the more you can stay in your body, go out into your field, go to the tree, breathe in your nose and out your mouth. And when you're in that state, ask yourself a question. Uh, I often will even make decisions. Again, I, this is a more evolved practice that I'll share later in my book, but uh, ask yourself questions when you're in that state, not when you're mental or scared. I have always struggled with doubt and should I, and I get overwhelmed with too many decisions and I've really, really struggled with this one. So I've really learned to get myself in the proper state first, get calm, get grounded, get your entire system to dilate, stop being mental, get in the experience, and then ask yourself questions a fun technique is to, let's say, should I work with Gary? Uh, I'll imagine Gary way out in the field. I'll make sure my body feels calm and open. And then I'll let Gary or the thought or the job offer or whatever it is, the idea of it get closer and closer. And I'll watch how my body feels. And I'll use my body as a truthometer or a feelometer. Because again, our intuition isn't a mental process. It's just a gut. It's a gut feeling. And as that idea, concept, image, person gets closer, you can start to see if your body tightens up. And I've learned that my body does talk to me. Uh, if my body tightens up, not, not great. Not, a, not an experience I want. And uh, I've tested it and gone against it many times. I've always pretty much regretted it. So I do pretty much live by that now. Thank you. Bethany. Hi, thank you, New York Times, for putting this together, first of all. This is amazing. And Jewel, thank you for sharing your uh, love and light through all this. This is really incredible. Um, so my question, can you guys hear me OK? Yeah, we hear you great. Um, my question is, I've been spending about the past year reflecting on my own spiritual practice. And I find 
um, that peace and that solace in the meditation. And I struggle so much with the mindfulness when it comes to the day to day. Um, it's so easy to just be pulled out of alignment and into everyone else's reality. And especially during this time where there's so much chaos and so many opinions and so much unknown, I really struggle with staying true to my own mindfulness practice and bringing myself back to that place. And I'm just wondering if you have any specific tips um, or, or practices that you utilize that help you in the moment come back to what we know is our authentic self and um, our deeper truth. Yeah, it's a great question. The daily practical application is really where the rubber meets the road. Um, you know, one thing is just realize you're trying to reprogram your brain. It's not a small feat. It's a completely doable feat, but give yourself some credit because it, it isn't an intuitive process and there really isn't a school, so it's confusing. Um, one thing is find one thing to focus on at a time. Um, you, you might really like my book, Never Broken. It really starts to talk about these things and then the website, jewelneverbroken.com because it'll give you some really simple daily practices. Um, one way is to focus on a habit. There's something called a habit loop where we have a stimulus, a response and a reward. So let's say um, I was stimulated by being homeless. Uh, my response was stealing and my reward was it gave me a sense of calm and control. It's a triad. It's not always easy to notice our stimulus, but it's pretty not obvious to notice a, a behavior that isn't great, right? I get irritated or I'm quick to anger or I steal or whatever it is. So pick one and see with curiosity if you can start to notice the stimulus. Maybe you feel out of control in your life. Uh, maybe you're in a job you like. Those aren't the quickest things to fix. We can really work on this one. So for me, I substituted stealing with writing. I just committed to it. I gutted it out. Um, it didn't feel great to write. Stealing felt better. It was just a, an, an exciting, quick hit. And I got a lot of biochemicals from it. So writing didn't feel that fun. But once I stuck with it for a couple of weeks, my body resensitized and did get a reward. And it was a much more lasting reward. And it became a job, which was completely unexpected. Um, and so think about one thing. You want to work on your irritation. And so I'm going to say one phrase that I find really magical. I sacrifice my attachment to shoplifting or perfectionism, whatever you want to say, and I dedicate it to. And so now every time I feel, uh, I'll use perfectionism because it's something I'm working on right now. Every time I feel just embroiled in perfectionism and I'm wanting to get really uptight, I stop and I dedicate it to compassion because I suck at compassion. I'm not that nice to myself. I push myself really hard. Um, and so that's, an example of putting a mindfulness practice into work. Look for a habit, look for that triad, look for what that middle one is and replace it um, with that sentence. There's lots of exercises like that up on my website. Um, the other thing you mentioned that I really think everybody can relate to is we get caught up in other people's agendas, right? We go out into the world, we hear strong opinions, strong narratives, and all of a sudden we kind of lose our own North Star, if you will. Going into your field and sitting at that tree and feeling what you feel like, what your energy feels like, all of our energy feels different. The more you can become intimate and familiar with what you feel like when you are in your center, the more you're going to notice when you get pulled out of it. And now you have a tool to get back in it. I hope that helps. Thank you. And we have time for just one more. Linda. Linda, Linda, come on, Linda. It's fun reading your guys' questions while we're waiting. Hello? Hello, Linda. I think I hit a button unnecessarily. I'm so sorry. <laughs> That's okay. You're here. <laughs> I heard my name. I, I went to a concert recently this year, and it was absolutely fabulous, and I love your books. I love your music. Um, thank you. Thanks. I didn't have a question. Oh. <laughs> well, maybe let's do one more question. Um, Betty. Mm -hmm. 
flipping through the questions on the chat if I can. And soon we will be allowed, we will be listening to um, Jewel's latest single, which is Grateful. So we'll have that performance just to close out the night. So everybody stick around. So Betty, um, if you can just unmute yourself and then you can ask a question. Okay, maybe let's move to Becca. Mm -hmm. While we're waiting, I see somebody asked, how do you deal with negative self-talk? Uh, a couple of things that I sort of already mentioned, we want to push away things that we don't find becoming. Uh, so there's part of us that feels very incentivized not to notice our self-talk because self-talk's uncomfortable to notice. When you learn to stop making enemies of uncomfortable or undesirable habits, and when you learn to start inviting them into your practice, you could invite them into your field by that tree, if you will, um, ask it what it wants. It's trying to protect you. It's a misunderstanding. You're using it to try and protect yourself and it might not be working and it might be painful. Um, I call it internalizing my abuser, you know, my negative self-talk. You know, when I left my dad, I just took over all that narrative myself and he wasn't around and I was doing it to myself. So becoming aware of it, putting it down on paper. Um, I saw that somebody asked if I still have anxiety after all these years. Absolutely. You know, you don't, how do I describe it? Again, we don't practice our spirituality or our mindfulness to become perfect. We practice it not to have control. We don't practice to say we're never gonna hurt again because we don't live in a sterile world. We interact with the world all the time. We kind of have to come to terms with the fact that we're in a very dynamic relationship with the world, with five primal forces of life, death, birth, decay, and creation. Those five primal forces are at work and around us all the time. We get blindsided by things. I used to practice because I thought if I got very clever and very observant, I could notice everything go wrong before it went wrong and avoid pain. You still struggle. You still have pain. Things still happen. But with practice, it doesn't tank you. It doesn't make me feel like, oh, my God, I'm never going to recover. It makes me go, I have the skill for this. It's like being a medic. You have bandages. You have stitches. You know what to do. You pick yourself up, you dust yourself off, you give yourself compassion, whatever it is, and you, the best way to say it is we don't get to control what life does to us, what life brings to us. We do get to control how it changes us. So we don't get to control every experience we have if we get fired or if somebody dies, but we do get to control and choose how we change. All of our hearts are destined to be broken. It's part of life what we do with those pieces makes us very interesting. And that's where when we can become consciously present, we now can be an artist, right? We're present to see how do I want to weave these broken pieces together to make something beautiful. Somebody asked, how did I forgive my parents or abusers? Um, forgiveness is a, is a word I don't think a lot of people understand. We confuse forgiving with condoning. Those are two different things. Uh, we think if we forgive somebody, it means we have to condone their behavior or accept their behavior. It is not true. Forgiveness is the only way to be free of your abuser or of a perpetrator. It's the cutting that thread that connects you. Sometimes the reason we want to stay angry is because it connects us, right? It was the last thing that connected me to my mom. It's sad. It's a hard thing to let go of. Um, but if you want to heal, if you really, really want to heal, you have to forgive. It's the only needle that knows how to mend those wounds. And it's not a gift you give them. It's a gift you give yourself. Mm -hmm. If we carry anger and we carry resentment, it's like burning down your own house to get rid of rats. It just harms yourself. It doesn't harm them one bit. It just devastates you. Um, and so forgiveness is a self-practice. It's a act of kindness to yourself. Uh, it's an act of kindness that maybe nobody else has ever shown you in your life. It takes tremendous courage. It takes a lot of releasing, having faith. Um, but again, it doesn't mean you forget. <laughs> it doesn't mean you condone it. Thank you. 
I think we'll move now to the performance, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, would love it. Hey, Tim, can we pull the camera back a tiny bit so yeah. they can see the camera? You can see it a little bit, uh, maybe back a little bit more. That's good. So this is called Grateful. This is about what I said of every thought, feeling, or action leads to one of two states, dilated or contracted. The first time I was able to do this, I was homeless and on a street corner and I felt a panic attack coming on and I decided to become profoundly grateful and I saw the sun shining through this palm tree and it cast a beautiful shadow on my skin and I was able to feel deeply, profoundly grateful that I was alive and I could feel it. I do have a new record coming out and this wasn't the first song I was going to release, but it felt like the right song to release right now because it's been a medicine for me and hopefully it helps other people too. And I forgot the words. Hang on really quick. <laughs> oh yeah, well, here we go. When everything's wrong And I can't find my song when darkness is all I see There is a remedy It's all the little things that make the world go round It's all the little things that are most powerful There's no politician, no sky to die no one can take the love from my heart And the love gonna shine In this heart of mine The sun gonna shine In this heart of mine The sun gonna shine Ooh, it's true Cause I can always be grateful In the loudest sound is your own life crashing down but when your friends when your friends they don't come around there's one true thing i found it's all the little things the bells that ring the green green grass and the birds that sing I'm gonna choose the bright side to see And no one, no one can take that from me Cause the sun gonna shine in this heart of mine The sun gonna shine in this heart of mine The sun gonna shine, ooh, it's true Cause I can always be So bring it on, bring it on, bring it on, bring it on now. Bring it on, 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 bring it on now. I'm singing on, singing on, singing on, I'm singing on I'm singing on, I'm singing on, singing on Cause the sun gonna shine in this heart of mine the sun gonna shine in this heart of mine The sun gonna shine, ooh, it's true Cause I can always be grateful We're clapping for everyone in the audience right now. Thank you so much. Thanks. Well, that was beautiful. Thank um, you. And um, I want to remind our viewers that this is part of an ongoing series about cultivating mental health, managing anxiety, and focusing on self-care during this time. To find out more about virtual events at the Times, please visit timesevents.nytimes.com.
And I'd like to give a special thanks to our subscribers who make our work possible. Thank you for joining us and we hope to see you again soon. Um, thank you so much, Jewel. I'm wondering if we can just close it out with a couple of those, that breathing. I think a, lot, a couple people weren't able to make the meditation. Sure. So maybe we can just do a quick like closing breathing session. Sure. Um, let's end with a really simple form of meditation. It's just following your breath. So we're going to pick, every day you could pick a number. If I have a lot of time, I'll do 100 breaths. If I don't have much time, I'll do 10 breaths. They've actually learned through studies with students and office workers that if you can just take even five breaths on every hour, your mental faculties increase. You have better focus, better observation. So um, this is something you can practice at work. I do it with my son. Um, so we're gonna close our eyes. You're gonna breathe in your nose and out your mouth. You really wanna think about unlocking your jaw Sometimes I really just want to make a sound when I breathe out, as silly as it sounds. I'll go, oh, like it just sometimes feels really good to make a sound. You can or you don't have to. It's totally up to you. Let's just do six breaths. And I want you to remember that this is a meditation you can do every day. Uh, if you just joined us, when you have thoughts, that's okay. It's normal because you have a brain. So meditation is not the absence of thoughts. It's just consciously being present noticing that you're thinking so every time you are like oh my gosh i was don't even know what number i'm on i was thinking about my grocery list that's great news because you noticed it and then come back to your breath and when you do that the act of noticing it and coming back to your breath that's when you do this bicep curl for your brain this is when you build new neural pathways in your brain um if you don't know what number you're on or you lost track of your number, the number doesn't matter. Just guess where you were at and continue. So we'll end this just doing six deep breaths. And remember, this is something you can do all the time. So shut your eyes, get really comfortable. We're gonna take a deep breath in through our nose and out through our mouth, unlock your jaw. You're going to take one more breath, and as we breathe in and exhale, imagine all of your negative thoughts as you inhale, and let all of them go as you exhale. Thank you all for having me today. It was a pleasure. Please feel free to visit jewelneverbroken.com for a lot of these exercises and uh, articles and things that our youth curate. Thank you so much. Thank you. Everyone for joining. Thanks. Bye. Bye.